The second speaker is uh, Dr. Flavon Forrest, um, who is postdoc uh, with, our, with our lab at IMRS at EPFL here, and he will be presenting some of our research uh, on um, segmenting without annotating crack segmentation via monitoring uh, for monitor and monitoring via post hoc classifier explanations. So please, Flavon, the floor is yours. Thank you, Olga, for the introduction. I hope you can hear me. It seems to work. Uh, so today I will talk, um, present to you some work we did on how to uh, do crack segmentation and severity monitoring uh, in images without doing uh, pixel level annotation of segmentation masks. And for this, we will use so-called post hoc classifier explanations, which is a family of uh, XAI, explainable AI techniques. So this work is a collaboration with um, the ECO lab, uh, which is a re remote sensing uh, lab. So related to the previous talk that you have seen, they also do uh, forest monitoring or wildfire detection, for example. And we work together on some railway applications. And this was a collaboration with Hugo Porta, a PhD student, and Davis Tuya from, from the ECO lab. Okay. okay. So here's the outline of my talk. So I will uh, start with some introduction to give some motivations of this, um, of this work. Then I'll introduce the actual methodology that we, um, that we worked on uh, to segment without annotating images. Then I will present our experimental settings. And finally, the results of our studies uh, in three different ways uh, in terms of segmentation quality, uh, severity, quantification abilities, and uh, growth monitoring of cracks. So um, as you know, cracks can appear in various types of infrastructures, um, may it be civil engineering or transportation, such as roads, uh, building, walls, bridges, um, or railway infrastructure elements. And so to ensure the, the safety of a structure and that the, that, that the element can retain its, its, um, its uh, function, we need to detect uh, cracks. And of course, when they start to develop, we need to monitor the evolution. Uh, to trigger some maintenance operation. So traditionally, uh, also as I said previously, we have of course manual uh, inspections. So we can send a human inspector on site. We can um, just, for example, walk uh, along the railway tracks or uh, on a bridge as we can see here. But of course, this is quite uh, tedious and very costly and has a lot of limitations. Uh, availability of the inspectors, um, human resources, of course. Um, they have also this problem of subjectivity. Each inspector can have a different judgment and different um, can make different decisions regarding to the severity or the presence, absence of a, of a damage. Um, it causes service interruptions. Uh, imagine uh, closing some bridge or some railway section to, to do the inspection. And finally, some locations are just not possible to access for humans, uh, like uh, some um, interior of a nuclear plant or some contaminated area or very hard to access uh, uh, locations such as uh, bridges or extreme locations. So one solution is to make this, uh, this uh, visual inspection uh, automatic uh, by uh, collecting images and then using automated techniques to process the image and uh, detect um, the potential presence of defects. For this, we can use different ways of collecting images, such as drones or some em embarked, uh, some embedded camera, uh, or also space imagery. But in our case, it will be mostly uh, mostly think of drones or embedded cameras on a train or on a vehicle. And what I have to mention uh, too is in this work, we only tackle um, surface cracks because we speak of visual inspection, so we don't consider. Uh, cracks that are inside the material uh, that would require different types of sensing, uh, such as ultrasonic or X-ray or anything else. So to do this uh, image-based crack detection, uh, we have uh, today a lot 
machine learning based approaches that are data driven and in particular uh, deep learning with um, convolutional neural networks among others. Um, but this is supervised training and uh, as such it requires to have large annotated data sets to, to train. So the task of crack detection can be expressed for example, as a classification task, you get an image and you have to train, uh, let's say a neural network to classify it in two classes. Um, one class for uh, the damage free uh, samples and one class for the cracks. So you get some binary outputs with a probability for each of the two classes. The problem is uh, this doesn't give a lot of information. If you detect a crack, you don't only want to detect it, but you also want to monitor its evolution. And for this, you would like to evaluate the severity level to predict maybe in when do you need to do a, um, a maintenance operation. So you need to do severity quantification and monitoring over time. This is crucial for, for uh, decision making, of course. So what we need actually is not only a zero one binary decision, it's this kind of binary mask that indicates uh, exactly pixel by pixel uh, where is um, located the crack. And this way we can do further measurements and extract some severity metrics such as the length, width, uh, area, or number of cracks in a given image. So classification does not, does not allow to do this severity quantification, but it's uh, fast and, and easy to, to, uh, to train because you just need to, um, when you want to label such a data set for training, you just need to give basically one bit of information per image, just zero, one, if it's a crack or not. So this is quite fast to label. On the other hand, what we would like is to get binary mask, so we could tackle uh, we we could um, tackle it as a semantic segmentation task, which is the classification of each uh, pixel of an image. So the outputs have the same size as the inputs, and um, with a zero or one, or one on each um, pixel of the image. This would allow to do the severity quantification and monitoring because we can extract severity measures from this mask. However, however, it's very tedious to label this, uh, to, to gather this type of labeled data sets. Uh, imagine you have to draw around each crack and, and label almost pixel by pixel. So you have to give him much more information. Let's say you have 256 pixels uh, images. It, you have to give about 64 kilobytes of information to the, two to the 16, so way more than the single uh, bit of information that was contained in the classification labels. So there's really a, a difference of, of different order of magnitude here in the labeling cost. So let's get now to the explored uh, approach. So uh, as we have seen, segmentation algorithms uh, are needed for, for crack detection and monitoring, but they are very data hungry. And the labeling of this, um, uh, for this task is very costly. And this is also a barrier to, to developing and deploying uh, automated systems for crack segmentation. And we would like to to find ways to, uh, to solve this issue. So the research question is, can we obtain these segmentations while avoiding uh, um, a fine-grained manual pixel level annotation? So one approach that uh, can be used is to do so-called uh, weakly supervised segmentation using explainable AI techniques. So what does it consist in? First, you train a classifier, so using only image level labels. This is how, uh, why we call it weakly supervised, because we only give uh, image level information uh, to discriminate between uh, damage free images and cracked samples. It could also be different types of damages, of course. Here we will focus on the binary case. At the second step, we want to ask our model, uh, which are the pixels in the input that have contributed to classify the image in the crack class? And this uh, map indicating the contribution of each pixel to the decision is called in the XAI uh, um, uh, language an attribution map because we attribute uh, the, the computer attribution, we attribute the decision of the classifier to each uh, feature or pixel in the input. And one uh, of the families of techniques that we can use is, is post hoc XAI techniques. So it, it's called post hoc because we consider a trained model and we um, we want to explain this model uh, a posteriori after it's, it's being trained, so it doesn't need to have an um, inherently transparent model. And finally, once we have these attribution maps, we can extract uh, approximate segmentation mask from them. Uh, why is this the case? Because we make the assumption that, at least for this task, uh, we should expect that the pixel would contribute to, to the crack class if and only if it is part uh, of the crack. So 
some uh, damage free part of the image should never contribute to the crack class. So we expect this correspondence between um, between explanation and 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 uh, segmentation. Uh, to to warn that this is not always the case. Actually, if you consider other types of images, uh, like natural images, uh, it's not always the case that segmentation is uh, corresponds to explanations. For example, you can classify an image with a boat on the ocean by looking at the water, actually, because it helps to classify the boat, but it's not related to the segmentation of the, of the boat. So in this case, we assume that it should work. Uh, some people already tried this. Uh, there was one recent work that uh, applied uh, one XAI technique called uh, layer-wise relevance propagation to damage segmentation. Um, but they did not compare different XAI methods, whereas we have uh, hundreds of different methods that exist, or at least dozens of different uh, uh, variants of XAI methods. And they did not tackle any severity quantification, which is very important, uh, as we explained. Uh, I just wanted to, to give maybe one uh, intuition to see how these XAI methods really work uh, without going too deep. So one example of technique uh, is this LRP that was already used previously. So uh, on, the, on the left, we have a neural network with a forward pass uh, represented. So you have some input X and you have some output F of X that you can imagine is just the score of uh, the probability of a crack, like some number between zero and one for the crack class, for example. So in LRP, what we do is uh, we want to see which uh, part of the inputs contributed to this decision. And this is working in a kind of backward pass. So it starts with the, with the outputs and then it distributes um, the, the, what, so the so-called relevance score. So the relevance is a bit attribution equivalent uh, in the LRP uh, uh, terms. Uh, and it distribute it and prop propagate it uh, in a backward way, uh, layer by layer. And um, to do this, uh, so we have these uh, messages um, uh, that we call R that are propagated from a layer L plus one to the previous layer L, uh, from a neuron J in one layer to a neuron uh, I in another layer. So we always note I and J neurons from different from two different layers. And to do this, we need to, to use so-called propagation uh, rules. Um, what we would like to have is this conservation property, like all the messages that are uh, output uh, from, from um, uh, the total amount of messages that are propagated from one neuron should uh, be uh, preserved. So we should have this, this sum uh, equality. This is actually very easy to do uh, in case of a linear network. We just have a network that is um, just multiplying uh, matrix, basically. We can just say that uh, the message is directly equal to the, um, to the, to the, to the pre-activation. So we have no, no activation function. So just directly x times w. And if we sum this, we directly get the output. So this works very easily. But if we have a non-linear network with many layers and with uh, a ReLU function or a, a hyperbolic tangent or anything else, in between, uh, this is very hard to, to obtain. And we can use different types of rules that only have approximate uh, um, conservation. And what we always have here is um, with any rules that we, that we use, there will be some kind of uh, leakage or loss of, uh, of relevance. So when we propagate, there will be always some parts that will not be totally preserved. So this is why it's called uh, it's more heuristic rules, let's, let's say. So the, here are some examples of, of, of rules. Uh, I will not go um, too deep uh, in, into them, but the idea is to use um, some ratio between the local activation and the global activation in the layer. Uh, what is the amount in, in one neuron divided by the total activation in the, in the layer? And we always have to use some tricks, such as adding uh, um, um, some epsilon to not have something that explodes because the activation are not bounded. They can be arbitrarily small or, or, or large. Uh, so all these rules actually have, yeah, ha have this idea of numerical stability. And they can also um, sometimes, such as the LRP alpha beta rule, handle differently the positive contribution. So what is increasing the outputs and the different, uh, the negative part of the of the attributions, um, yeah, so that we can give different weights to, to this to this uh, to this um, contributions. So uh, in this technique, what is kind of special is that we have these different rules, and 
usually we use a different rule for different types of layers. For example, in the convolution network that we will use, we will use uh, uh, one rule for the first um, convolutional layer, then one rule for all the subsequent layers, and then a different rule for the fully connected layers, and one rule for, for the outputs. So this is somehow some, some of the findings of, of, of the people who came up with this idea. And the idea is to have some, some uh, uh, interesting activations at the end without losing too much information. Okay, so this was one example. So in, in our work, we, our main con contribution is to evaluate and compare uh, different post hoc XAI methods and not, not only one, and then to investigate uh, the capabilities for uh, quantifying the severity of the crack and monitoring its growth. So this is a methodology we propose. Uh, so first we collect a data set of uh, damage free and cracked samples to train the classifier. This is nothing new. Um, then we extract uh, these attribution maps from the, um, from the trained classifier. So this is what we get. So we have uh, um, brighter colors when we have more, uh, more uh, higher values of the, of the attributions. And then we have to do some post-processing to obtain binary masks. So we do this uh, in a kind of generic way, but it's a two-step two process. Uh, we propose first to binarize uh, the input using some threshold link technique to make it uh, binary. And then as you see, attributions are always a bit noisy and are not very, very clean. Uh, this, is one, this one is actually quite good. Uh, so we have to do some further post-processing to obtain uh, something uh, similar to a real uh, segmentation mask. So what we do the second step is morphological operations. And uh, more concretely, we use uh, morphological closing in order to close the, the holes in the, in the mask that we obtain. Okay, and finally, we can extract uh, severity metrics uh, by measuring properties of this binary mask, such as crack width, area, et cetera. Okay, let's go to our experimental uh, settings. So here are the um, uh, methods that we compare in terms of XCI methods. Uh, this is what we call weakly supervised because we only use um, information of, of uh, image level uh, labels. So we evaluate these methods. So we have um, two methods based on, on gradients. Uh, to give some intuition, um, the methods based on gradients, of course, are quite intuitive because we think that uh, if some variable is important, its gradient should also be uh, uh, larger. But the problem is always uh, what is the root point you use to compute the, the gradient. So input gradient is really computing just the gradient at the current input and multiplying it with the input. So it's really measuring only the local uh, importance uh, at the input. Integrated gradients is uh, doing it in a different way. It is actually starting from a um, black image uh, or some reference image that you, that you give that is supposed to have a reference level of, of attribution. And then you interpolate uh, between this image and your input, and you compute the gradients over this uh, sequence, and you average it. And then we have deep lift, uh, which is a different way of doing it. Um, deep lift shaft, gradient shaft, which is some variant of these methods are based on Shapley uh, values and some heuristic approximation for deep uh, networks. And finally, the layer-wise relevance propagation that we already saw. And then we also compare to two um, so-called, yeah, let's say unsupervised methods that, are, um, that do not require any uh, training of the classifier or image level labels. So we first try as a baseline to just directly um, binarize the raw image to see what uh, performance we get. And we also evaluated um, to use a convolutional autoencoder to reconstruct uh, only uh, normal um, damage-free images and see if we can use this, uh, the, the residuals of the autoencoder, so the error of reconstruction per pixel as um, a kind of anomaly detection method and to, to also extract uh, some segmentation mask. And finally, we always uh, compare to the performance that could be obtained with a supervised model if we had access to the ground truth labels. Here we use a, a, a unit. So this is for us a kind of oracle model because we, it's supposed to be superior to everything that we can get because we have pixel level labels. Uh, here are the architectures that we use. So we have uh, VDG 11 as our backbone throughout all methods. 
it's a widely used method and it also allows to implement these XAI methods uh, in a straightforward way. Uh, we just uh, reduce the number of, of uh, neurons in the fully connected layers. So in the traditional VDG, you have 4,096. And here we have a smaller data set, so we put only 128 neurons. So this is our classifier for the convolutional autoencoder. We use uh, also the, uh, the backbone of the VDG11 as an encoder, and we use a symmetrical decoder. And for units, it is um, a unit 11, so also the same kind of encoder. Just as in a unit, we have these, uh, these copy and concatenate uh, connections um, that you probably know from, from units. Okay, uh, this is our data set. So we have um, a data set from uh, Earthquake's uh, lab at the PFL that is consisting in um, patches from a stone masonry wall. Uh, we, so we have already the ground truth mask for, for the cracked patches uh, to evaluate the levels. And then we also added some negative images that come from the same wall. Um, yes, yep. that's it. So cool. let's, go, let's go to the results. So uh, first we evaluate the um, performance of the segmentation. So the segmentation quality that we can obtain. Uh, so qualitatively, here is some, some examples of what we can obtain. You have the true uh, segmentation mask on the, on the left column. Then you have um, the comparison between six XAI based methods before doing the morphological closing. This is after thresholding compared to what we get uh, with unsupervised methods that are, uh, as you see, completely unable to separate the texture, the noisy texture of the material from the crack. Um, in particular, the convolution autoencoder can not really learn this distribution. So it's not able to reconstruct accurately the inputs because this wall texture is so noisy that it cannot really be uh, learned by, by the autoencoder. Uh, and on the red, you have the output of the supervised uh, method that is actually uh, very close to the ground truth, except for some cracks that are missed. For instance, here you have some thin crack that is two thin cracks that are missed even by the supervised uh, method. So what you first see is that the explanations are, of course, more noisy than what we get with the units. Uh, 